Hi there, in this tutor to you politics topic video we're going to be taking a look at devolution in Scotland. We'll start with a little bit of historical context which whilst not necessarily strictly important or required for A-level politics really helps to give us a stronger sense of understanding in terms of where Scotland is today. So if we start back with 1707, we could go back further, but let's start with 1707 and the Treaty of Union with England and Wales, which ultimately led to the Act of Union forming the country um, as, as a whole. In 1885, the Scottish Office and Secretary for Scotland were created. In other words, there was a specific ministerial post it was another 50 years or so until exactly the same treatment occurred for Wales. Um, in 1926, the Secretary of State for Scotland became a full ministerial post. Um, 1942, we had the Scottish Covenant Association being formed, which really sought independence, in other words, much more than home rule, actual independence from the Union. The 1973 Kilbrandon report recommended that Scotland had a devolved legislature and this led to the proposal in the 1978 Scotland Act under the Labour government at the time that there should be a Scottish Parliament but that that Parliament will be subject to that being approved via a referendum in Scotland. Now that referendum did go ahead in 1979 and indeed, the people of Scotland voted in favour of their own parliament. But under the rules set out in the Scotland Act 1978, the turnout was actually too low. And so not enough, uh, not a significant enough proportion of the electorate had voted in favour. So nothing happened for some time until 1997. In 1979, the Scottish National Party withdrew their support for the government and that forced the Callaghan government to collapse. They would just not be able to push through any legislation in Westminster without the support of the SNP. Clearly that then led to the victory of Margaret Thatcher and her Conservative Party and they stayed in power until 1997. So 1997 we saw the devolution referendum followed by the 1998 Scotland Act. Now 1997 is a fairly significant date when we're studying A-level politics because that was the year in which Tony Blair and his new Labour Party won a landslide election victory in Westminster. Why did devolution appear on the agenda at that point? Well, devolution to the regions was a key part and policy of that winning Labour manifesto in 1997. But it wasn't really there because Tony Blair was a staunch supporter of devolution. In fact, there are two other quite key reasons as to why devolution appeared on the manifesto for Labour in 1997. The first reason is that in the run up to the election, Opinion polls had shown that the Conservative Party would be very unlikely to hold on to their position as the majority party. But it wasn't completely clear that the Labour Party would have an outright majority. So early negotiations had already taken place between Labour and the Liberal Democrats in terms of forming um, a coalition or perhaps even a confidence and supply arrangement. And as part of those discussions, the Liberal Democrats were very keen supporters of devolution and had helped to influence the Labour manifesto to include devolution on the agenda. Secondly, there was also the legacy of former Labour leader John Smith, who had died in office in 1994. Now, he was a very keen supporter of devolution to the regions. Tony Blair realised that he was going to have to keep the support of the old Labour politicians as he tried to modernise the Labour Party and introduce his third way of politics, in other words, new Labour. So by including a key policy of John Smith, it helped to use John Smith's legacy and helped to create support for that 1997 manifesto. So if we think about what happened in 1997, um, there was a 
a referendum, a type of referendum that we call a pre-legislative referendum. In other words, a referendum or direct democratic vote by the people of Scotland, the outcome of which would ultimately lead to changes in the law. Now, this was a really unusual referendum. It was very rare to have a red referendum where there are two key questions. The first question was whether there was indeed enough support for a devolved Scottish Parliament. And the second question focused on the type of devolution um, and as to whether a Scottish Parliament should have some fiscal or financial devolution. In other words, have a little control over their taxes and spending. In the end, the turnout was reasonably high at 60.13%, which was a good 10 percentage points higher than the turnout in the Welsh referendum, which happened the following week. 74.29% of the voters turning out voted in favour of a Scottish Parliament. And on the second question, that of tax varying powers, a slightly lower proportion of supporters, but still a significant winning margin. In terms of the campaigns, the Yes campaign was Scotland Forward, supported by Scottish Labour, the SNP, inevitably, the Lib Dems and the Scottish Greens. The No campaign was Think Twice, supported by the Conservatives. The Conservatives also supported the No campaign in Wales. The outcome of that referendum led to the Scotland Act 1998 being passed in Westminster. This created the Scottish Parliament, set out the electoral system for members of Scottish Parliament and laid out the legislative process. The electoral system for members of Scottish Parliament or MSPs is quite an interesting one. It's a bit of a mixed bag. So there are 73 constituencies in Scotland and each of those constituencies is able to elect one single member to the Scottish Parliament in a first past the post system in the same process that we use for elections to Westminster. There is also um, in use the um, additional member system, the AMS system, whereby Scotland is split into eight regions and in each of those regions, the parties have a list of possible candidates that could represent their party. Each region um, elects seven MSPs. Um, and that is a proportional representation system based on regional party lists. The combination of first past the post and AMS results are linked using something called the De Hunt formula, which allows Scottish Parliament to be as representative as possible, as well as giving people in Scotland a specific named person, their MSP, that can follow up issues on their behalf. The Scotland Act 1998 specifically said that the UK Parliament continued to have power to legislate on Scotland. In other words, parliamentary sovereignty was not undermined, but it also set out the very specific policies and well policy areas that would be directly reserved to, uh, to Westminster, what we call a reserved powers system. That's very different to the situation that we saw in Wales, um, in Wales, it was more of a conferred powers approach, whereby Westminster would give Wales some powers um, and everything else will be retained by Westminster. So in other words, sort of the other way around. So was Scottish devolution an initial success? Well, in favour of Scottish devolution initially being a success, there was a much more accessible parliament and the Scots were able to use what is called a direct petition to actually request information or push policy, ideas, thoughts and comments straight to their MSPs and Scottish Parliament. So a very accessible Parliament in Edinburgh. Many of the policies were also fairly agreeable um, and desired, desirable by the electorate. For example, free personal care, um, significant transparency in terms of politicians expenses and so on. Overall, there was also arguably significantly improved political engagement. People of Scotland feeling like there were politicians actually interested in Scottish issues, concerns. It was also arguably better in terms of holding the government to account. Prior to the establishing of the Scottish Parliament, 
there were Scottish question times in Parliament in Westminster just seven times a year. So only seven opportunities to really question the Secretary of State for Scotland. However, there was one major problem with devolution, which was called the um, or termed the West Lothian question um, after the constituency of the MP who initially raised the problem. And the West Lothian question um, means that Scottish MPs in Westminster are able to vote on issues such as education, which is an English issue. England um, has its own education system. Um, education has been devolved to the regions in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so this Scottish MP would be able to vote on, for example, education policy that would only affect schools in England, not schools in Scotland, and could effectively overturn legislation or block legislation that would be specifically relevant to England. However, the reverse was not true. So MPs in Westminster would not be able to vote on legislation or indeed even introduce legislation that was related to education in Scotland. And this seemed like a significant imbalance. This has more recently been um, sorted out by the concept of English votes for English laws or evil in Westminster, whereby only English MPs will vote on issues relevant to England only. Arguably, very little was done overall to tackle specifically Scottish issues, areas of poverty, areas of alcoholism, areas of crime. And some commentators have argued that whilst the policies were certainly voter friendly, um, maybe they were indeed at the expense of more effective policies. Um, the media has often called this devolution distraction. So what happened in Scotland after that point? Um, the Scottish Parliament building opened in 2004. Whilst there were significant issues at the time with expenses and costs, it is now regarded as an iconic building and a real source of national pride. The Scottish Parliament Constituencies Act 2004 ruled that the constituencies for Scottish Parliament no longer had to be exactly the same as those for Westminster. In 2005, power over Scottish railways was transferred from Westminster to Scotland. And whilst now this might seem relatively insignificant, at the time this was regarded as highly significant by the Scottish First Minister. Following the 2007 Scottish Parliament election, the Scottish executive rebranded themselves as the Scottish government. That was the ruling SNP. This did become a official legal renaming in the Scotland Act 2012. And this really helped to increase the separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. So later on in the Labour government's time in power, we had the Kalman Commission of 2007 to 2009, the aims of which are outlined on the screen there for you, really taking a look at whether devolution had worked and whether any significant changes need to be made. This in resulted from an opposition motion um, in the Scottish Parliament by Labour, um, supported by the Conservatives and Lib Dems, but actually opposed by the governing SNP, who were concerned that the Commission might recommend um, either a reversal of devolution or prevent the SNP from seeking independence, which was ultimately the aim of their party. Now, the Kalman Commission ultimately concluded that devolution was indeed a success and should definitely stay. They also said that the Scottish Parliament should have more financial or fiscal devolutionary powers, for example, to raise tax, specifically income tax, and have a greater ability to borrow, perhaps via their own bond issues. Um, the Common Commission also concluded that the Barnett formula, which is the technique used for calculating funding for the regions by Westminster needed replacement. Um, now, the Barnett formula has been fairly controversial and disliked in terms of whether it actually allocates funding fairly. At the time of recording this video in 2017, that formula still exists and still has not been replaced. 
The Common Commission also argued that there needed to be much better dialogue between Westminster and the Scottish Parliament. For example, actually attending each other's sessions, sharing thoughts in committee meetings um, and ministers working much more closely with each other. They also said that there should be much more improved scrutiny of bills at different stages of the legislative process in Scottish Parliament. The findings of the Commission ultimately resulted in a 2009 white paper um, supported by Gordon Brown and it mostly focused on tax powers and elections but Gordon Brown was not necessarily known as a Prime Minister who got things done quickly and indeed the Labour Party failed to act on it before the next general election in 2012 when of course Labour lost power and we saw the coalition government of the Conservatives and Lib Dems in Westminster. However, the findings of that white paper, which were based on the Commission, were subsequently used mostly as the basis for the Scotland Bill 2012. So overall, was Labour's devolution programme in Scotland a success or not? Well, on the side of arguing that yes it was indeed a success there has certainly been greater engagement in politics for scots and certainly an improved accountability of government decisions and legislation um, in terms of the scottish people um, devolution is still ongoing this suggests that it continues to be desired in other words it's a process rather than an event which makes it very difficult to come up with a very firm um, assessment of whether it has been a success but the fact that it continues suggests that the devolution process is certainly desirable and successful. On the other hand arguably devolution has increased nationalism in Scotland ultimately leading to the independence referendum of just a few years ago and it could possibly lead to the breakup of the UK. This is certainly the case um, in the post-Brexit climate um, the Scottish people voted very very much overwhelmingly in favour of remaining in the EU putting them very much at odds with the national vote overall for the UK. This will be discussed a little bit later in this topic video. Um, arguably uh, local government in Scotland has become a lot less important so councils for example less important than they were before devolution potentially leading to wastage and a lack of understanding of exactly who has responsibility for what. And it also means that the UK's constitution has fundamentally changed. The UK is certainly no longer truly unitary. It's more of a quasi-federal system. Now, it's really difficult to assess whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but this was never really the aim of, um, of Labour's constitutional change programme. Um, there are as many political commentators arguing that this is a good thing as there are arguing that this is a bad thing. As with everything in politics, there's always a halfway house. So there have certainly been some successes, for example, social care, um, but failures, particularly education, Scottish children do no, uh, no longer seem to perform quite as highly as their counterparts everywhere else in the UK. Um, arguably, whether it's a success potentially depends on your political ideology and where you stand along the political spectrum. It's very difficult to make a completely neutral and independent assessment. Um, and the main issue, as we referred to earlier, the, the, the issue that has perhaps been most controversial has been the use of list MSPs. So if you remember from a few moments ago, we mentioned the electoral system being a combination of first past the post and the additional member system with the party lists. Now, the, M the MSPs elected from the constituencies are generally regarded as being effective because they can be easily held to account by the people who have voted for them in their constituencies. The list MSPs, however, are regarded by many Scots as being a lot less effective. It's worth just taking a moment to pause the video here and have a little look through the quotes here. These come from Tony Blair writing well after his time in power and looking back maybe with a little regret on exactly what happened with devolution in Scotland and Wales. <laughs> 
So it's worth taking a close look there. In other words, he's particularly concerned about the impact on the breakup of the United Kingdom. So what happened? What has happened post 2012? We've already mentioned earlier the Scotland Act 2012, which came out of the Calman Commission recommendations. And this Scotland Act gave Scotland a number of new powers, some of which are outlined on the screen here for you. Firstly, it gave them the ability to change income tax by up to 10p, which is a fairly significant difference compared to England. It also gave um, more fiscal or financial devolution in the form of being able to set stamp duty and landfill tax, borrowing up to £2.2 billion a year purely for Scottish purposes. Um, linked with that, they also created Revenue Scotland so that Scottish finances and tax powers did no longer have to go through HMRC as they do um, in England and Wales. It also meant that Scotland would have better representation in institutions such as the BBC and gave them more power to set law over social issues such as drugs, driving and gun law. Interestingly, the UK Parliament said that in order to pass the Scotland Act 2012 in Westminster, it would need a legislative consent motion from the Scottish Parliament to pass the bill. In other words, whilst they do have parliamentary sovereignty in Westminster, they still wanted the Scottish Parliament to effectively give their consent to the bill. Now, the Scottish Parliament actually initially wanted to block the bill because the SNP, the ruling party at the time, said that they wanted more power and indeed a move towards independence. However, they did eventually capitulate and agreed that the Scotland Act 2012 could indeed be passed. Now, we need to have a little, a little look at the independence referendum. In terms of the background, the SNP had announced in 2009 that it did want to hold a referendum in 2010 on whether Scotland should be a independent country, in other words, going much further than devolution. However, the bill did not pass in the Scottish Parliament because at the time the SNP only had a minority government and could not command enough support for that bill to pass. However, from 2011, the SNP did have a majority in Scottish Parliament and again they introduced a referendum bill. They did suggest that in a referendum that there could be an extra option, um, so not just a yes or no, but some kind of halfway house, which we called Devo Max. Um, this was um, rejected by the... Um, by the commission looking at the um, the possible question for a referendum and said it just needed to be a simple yes no question. The Edinburgh Agreement 2012 um, resulted in the UK Parliament legislating to allow Scotland to hold a referendum. A good example there of parliamentary sovereignty. That referendum was indeed held in 2014 in the September of 2014 and the question was, should Scotland be an independent country? The stats are quite incredible, really. The turnout was 84.6%, the largest ever for a referendum in Britain. Um, the yes votes were 44.7% and no 55.3%. It was expected to have been closer than that. Interestingly, 16-year-olds were allowed to vote, so a bit of a change to the franchise there. Um, the campaigns were Yes Scotland in favour of independence and Better Together voting against independence. So what were the key issues in this referendum? It's worth just taking a look at one or two of these and you can take your own time to just pause the video here if you want to have a look at them. So these are some of the key questions that people really wanted answering, although at the time many voters felt that these questions had not been significantly answered when they were making their decisions on polling day. So for example, what would happen to farmers? Would they receive more or less payments from the European Union under the Common Agricultural Policy? Indeed, would Scotland even be able to be a member of the European Union? That in itself was not well established. Would people in Scotland have their own citizenship? Would they also be British citizens? Would it be one, the other or both? Um, there were significant concerns raised that the Scottish financial system was not stable enough to 
um, to not have a repeat of the financial crisis from several years earlier without the support of the Bank of England and potential lending facilities or the ability to be nationalised or part nationalised by the British government. Um, whether there would be a single energy market. So, for example, would Scotland be able to tap into the energy supplies of the national grid in England or would they have to be able to find their own sources of energy? All of these are clearly really significant questions. Maybe if they had been clearly and carefully answered before the referendum, it might have altered the outcome of that referendum or indeed affected the way that people vote. What was the overall impact of the referendum? Despite being a vote for no independence, it has been a really significant referendum, although on the face of it, nothing has changed. It's led to a significant increase in nationalism in Scotland. Following the referendum, many people joined the SNP um, and other Yes Scotland campaign um, political parties. And it led to a huge rise in the number of MPs in Westminster from the SNP in the 2015 general election. Whilst that number has now fallen back down to around 35, um, they still have a significant part to play in Westminster. It also led to Devo Max. So this was initially suggested as one of the third options on the ballot paper um, and was rejected. In fact, just three days before the referendum, an all-party commission, the Smith Commission, led to um, agreement by all the main parties that Devo Max, if the outcome was a no vote, would indeed be implemented. This in turn led to the Scotland Act of 2016 and ultimately led to the West Lothian question that we looked at earlier being tackled via evil or English votes for English laws. So the Scotland Act 2016 gave Scotland much more control over its electoral system. They could change from the combination of first past the post and AMS if they now choose to. It also gave them yet more financial control in terms of setting their own taxes, for example, air passenger duty and the right to receive half of the VAT raised in Scotland. Finally, the Scotland Act gave the Scots much more control over welfare benefits, their levels and recipients. Now the big question that remains is the impact of Brexit on Scottish devolution and at the moment it's very difficult for us to make any kind of assessment as to where this might head. But there are some facts and key dates that we are aware of and that students should really know. So in the 2016 EU referendum, Scotland voted 62% in favour of Remain. This is very different from the rest of the UK. Now, because the UK as a whole voted to leave, this ultimately means that Scotland will be leaving the EU against its wishes. So Nicola Sturgeon, the leader of the SNP, said that a second referendum must be on the table. In other words, the context had now changed so much that it would be worth another vote. So... Earlier in 2017, the Scottish Parliament did indeed vote in favour of a second independence referendum in spring 2019, which is the point when the UK leaves the EU. However, the UK government responded by saying that they would block such a referendum until the early 2020s. In other words, once the transitional arrangements post the actual leaving of the EU had um, been established and that we actually knew a little bit more about what was going on. Um, Nicola Sturgeon ultimately had to back down on this second independence referendum when the SNP lost seats in Westminster in the 2017 general election. It would make it very difficult to actually get the, um, the legislation through the Westminster Parliament. So legislation similar to the Edinburgh Agreement of 2012 just would be very unlikely to be passed. So that's the current state of play in terms of Scottish devolution, clearly there will be interesting times ahead as Brexit negotiations continue. So watch this space at Tutor2U. Thanks for watching and do join us for another topic video.